Thank you, Chip, and thank you, worship team, leading us in such meaningful songs of praise. There was mention made of COVID-19. Boy, it's a distant memory, isn't it? Did you know that if you got the vaccination against COVID-19 that you have the mark of the beast? No. Didn't anyone ever tell you that if you put numbers to a, a letters, Corona spells 666, right? I'm, I'm just kidding, but at least I have your attention now, don't I? But if you Google, is COVID-19, is the COVID-19 vaccine the mark of the beast? You will get pages of hits, many of them news articles written in 2021 about the fear of many religious people and evangelical Christians who wouldn't take the vaccine because they thought it was, quote, the mark of the beast of Revelation. Now, there may have been many other reasons people didn't want to get vaccinated. The vaccination was developed so quickly, not enough information on its effectiveness, at least not at first, and some feared it caused infertility, some deaths were associated with the vaccine. But according to some of the articles, the belief that COVID-19 vaccine was the mark of the beast was apparently widespread among evangelicals. I mean, after all, Bill Gates, isn't he the beast? <laughs> Well, one of the dangers in reading the book of Revelation is the reader's tendency to find all kinds of associations in our modern context and our circumstances and events happening around the world today. And most of these associations will one day prove completely ridiculous. Now, the ones who look foolish in the end are the well-meaning evangelical Christians who live in fear. And another danger in the study of the, or the preaching of the book of Revelation is to spend an inordinate amount of time on deciphering the cryptic references and the symbolism and trying to prove that your own interpretation of the symbols and visions is the right one. Well, even if we are right in our interpretation, and by the way, we won't know for sure if we're right until those predictions become historical, the study of Revelation doesn't provide a whole lot of applications that affect how we're to behave today. Because if the events that are being described in the book of Revelation are yet future events, well, how does that affect then my work ethic today or my marriage relationship today or how I raise my children or my financial spending habits? Surely there are better passages of scripture for us to study and to read and to preach on than Revelation for that. But like other prophetic books in the Bible, Revelation is a book that is intended to give meaning and hope to the readers or listeners who believe that it is indeed God's revelation and us who are trying to make sense of how our present circumstances fit into the overall plan of the sovereign almighty God. Because biblical prophecy is especially relevant in times of persecution or hardship because Let's face it, there will be times when it would seem from our perspective that God is absent or he's forgotten all about his people or he's unable to fulfill the promises he's made. And when things in our world and from our perspective don't seem to make sense, then the fact that the words of God's prophets in the past have indeed come to pass as he has declared, that the ancient prophecies have indeed been fulfilled and Yes, there may be years or even decades or centuries that pass between the, when the prophecy was made and its fulfillment. God has always delivered on his warnings of curses and on his assurances of blessings. And friends, that ought to give us confidence in our faith. It should give us courage in our weaknesses and boldness in our testimony. And just like the prophecies of the Old Testament, the symbolism that we find in the book of Revelation will only be fully understood when we can look back on the events that were once predicted. And just like the ancient prophecies, God lets his people see what's behind this curtain between the physical and the spiritual worlds. He gives us either warnings or promises of blessings to keep us, his people, steadfast in our faith. And he reveals things to come in order to give us, his people, hope. So today, we're going to closely look at Revelation chapter 13, which contains visions of not just one beast, but two. And a reference, as you all expect, of 666, the number of the beast. Now, if your curiosity today 
will only be satisfied with the specific identity of who is this beast and what is the mark of the beast, well, I'm afraid I will not be able to deliver today. All right? But what I can deliver today, more importantly, is some of the insights into the spiritual world that these visions give us today and what kind of impact they ought to have on how we live today. Because in fact, our author, John, and our divine author, God makes it quite clear for us to see what the purpose of these visions we're going to look at today, what those purposes are. And there are two. You'll find them in verse 10 of chapter 13, where he says, here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. And in verse 18, where he says, this calls for wisdom. And there you have it. That's it. Those are the two things that, are, that we're being called to today. And we're going to look at the visions of both these beasts, but our emphasis will be on what these visions call us to. Now, as we read from the text, the visions of these beasts, notice that three things John gives us with both of them. He gives us first a description of the beast's appearance and features. Secondly, a description of the beast's authority and activities. And then finally, this call, which I've already mentioned what it is. And the visions of chapter 13 are, in fact, a continuation of the vision seen in chapter 12 that Chip so ably preached on last week. And so we could see today's message is really as part two of a two-part message on chapters 12 and 13. So before we read chapter 13, I want us to read the last verse of chapter 12, verse 17, on this vision of, as if you remember from last week, a woman and the great red dragon. Verse 17 of chapter 12 says this, Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. And now comes chapter 13, the visions of two beasts. We'll look at the first one through verse 10. Verse 1 of chapter 13 says this, And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed. And the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them, and authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation, and all who dwell on earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with a sword, with a sword must he be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. So you see here the description first of his appearance and features, then of his activity and his um, and his authority, and then finally the call. Appearance and features has 10 horns, each with a diadem. We won't go into the symbolism today. Seven heads, each with blasphemous names. One of its heads, notice, seemed to have a mortal wound, but that wound was healed. Its wound caused the whole earth to marvel, a word that means to wonder, to be in awe, amazement, as they followed the beast, presumably because this beast had recovered from what should have been a fatal blow. And as the world marveled, they also worshipped this beast. And though it rises out of the sea in this vision, this beast has features of a variety of land animals. A leopard, but feet like a bear. A mouth like a lion's, and mouth that speaks haughty and blasphemous words. And notice how John describes the authority and activity. That the dragon, which was from chapter 12, gave the beast his power, his throne, and great authority. And using the dragon's power, throne, and authority, this beast spoke haughty and blasphemous words against God, his name, his dwelling, and those who dwell with him. Now, he was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. Notice what he uses his authority for, to make war 
on the saints and even conquer them. And he had authority over everyone on the, who dwelt on earth. And he is worshipped by everyone except, did you notice? Except those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And so here comes John's call. First a call to attention and then a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Because everyone will either be taken captive or slain. So the saint must endure and keep his faith. The word for endurance is related to the word for to stay or to remain. You can translate it sometimes as steadfastness. It simply means that it is the power to withstand hardship or stress. It describes the inner fortitude required to overcome what is challenging or difficult. Think about the Olympic medals. None of them would be worth achieving were it not for the steadfastness and the endurance that was required of each athlete. Now, faith, of course, refers to our faith in Jesus Christ, our faith in him as the son of God and savior whose sacrifice on Calvary atoned for our sins. It is our core belief on the identity of Jesus Christ as the son of God, the only God, glorious and all powerful, God, the father, God, the shepherd. And the enemy wants us to surrender or to abandon our faith. And so that's why the calling to us is to remain steadfast, to endure, to have a faith that's resilient against the challenges that we face. Because we know from chapter 12, right, that this is the dragon who, that, that the dragon who gave his power in this throne is, and I quote, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. And we know from chapter 12 that this dragon is at war with his angels fighting against God and his angels in heaven. And we also know that this dragon was defeated against the kingdom of God, and he and his angels were cast out of heaven, quote, thrown down to the earth. And it was by the authority of Jesus Christ that the brothers, the saints, whom the devil accuses day and night before our God, it is by the authority of Jesus Christ that the brothers are declared victors against this dragon. Because... The brothers have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony because they were not afraid to lose their lives in the fight against him. So if this dragon is the one who gives this beast from the sea his power, his throne, and his authority, then we can safely assume that this authority and this power is to continue his effort to wage war with the kingdom of God. It is to continue to accuse the brothers for whom the lamb was slain. And indeed, this is exactly what chapter 13 confirms, that in this vision of the beast that rises out of the sea, this beast was allowed to make war on the saints to conquer them. Now, there's a couple of things we need to make sure that we understand, a couple of points here. First, this beast of the sea has a mouth that utters haughty and blasphemous words. What does haughty mean? Well, it's literally great or loud words, that these words are prideful, they're boastful, they're exalting and glorifying himself above anyone else, but especially above God, who is the only one who's worthy of all glory and exaltation. Blasphemous words, meaning profane or unholy words, means that they are slanderous against God, cursing God, reviling God, taking that which is sacred and holy, like his name and his holy character, and then denigrating it. In other words, reducing its worth. And this is Satan, the power and authority behind this beast, who is the deceiver of the whole world. So from him, from his mouth, whether it's a boast or a blasphemy, it's all a lie. He lies about himself. He lies about God. He lies about the saints. He lies about who's victorious in the battle. He lies about the identity of Christ and his work. He lies about everything. And like Satan would, this beast from the sea opens its mouth to blaspheme God, to blaspheme his name, to blaspheme his dwelling. That's the first thing I want us to notice. Secondly, I want us to notice that the beast of the sea also has authority that's worldwide. But it is an authority that's limited and temporary. Did you notice that? It was allowed to exercise authority. That means a greater authority has given him authority or permitted him this authority. And the authority given to him was for a specific period of 42 months. Now, it might be literal months, maybe it's figurative. One thing that's clear is it's not indefinite. And its authority, although it's a great authority, comes from a dragon who was cast out of heaven 
at the declaration that the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. The devil knows that his time is short from chapter 12, right? And this beast exercises its authority for one purpose, to make war on the saints and to conquer them. But to conquer them does not mean that those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life will worship this beast, right? Because all who dwell on earth will worship the beast, except for those who, from before the foundation of the world, have their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So to conquer the saints, in this context we see here, someone move around so that the lights switch on again. Well, we'll just say this in the dark then. To conquer the saints in this context, as one commentary puts it, quote, refers not to the subversion of their faith, okay, not to the subversion of their faith, but to the destruction of their physical lives. Indeed, Jesus himself told his disciples not to fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. See, those who conquer the devil are those who loved not their lives even unto death. In other words, they were willing to die for their faith. That's the conquering that's possible, not that they would subvert their faith. And the saying which John also uses to call attention, he says, some will be taken captive and others will be slain. And the third thing I want us to notice is that both the dragon and this beast from the sea desire to be worshipped by all. But they will not be worshipped by those who belong to the Lamb. See, worship seems to be the motive of this dragon in his war against the Lord and those who belong to the Lord. And if Satan is indeed this day star of Isaiah 14, which there seems to be plenty of biblical evidence that compels us to believe that it is, then his pride is what compels him to seek the highest throne. It is Satan's desire to make himself like the Most High. Think about when he approached God about Job's faithfulness to the Lord. Satan was certain that as soon as God's protection around Job would be removed, Job would no longer fear the Lord, and instead he would curse you to your face, he said. Right? But Satan was certain that Job's faithfulness and loyalty and worship to God alone was because Job enjoyed God's goodness. But guess what? Satan was wrong. And the beast of the sea uses his authority from the dragon to blaspheme God, to war against the saints, and the result of his authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation, the people of the earth will worship this beast. And they'll say, who is like the beast? Kind of the same kind of praise that we give to God when we say, my soul will rejoice in the Lord, exulting in his salvation. All my bones shall say, O Lord, who is like you? This beast, this authority from the devil, desires that kind of praise. So, friends, the call to us is very clear. We are called to endurance and faith. Satan is this beast to whom he has granted, or sorry, Satan and the beast to whom he's granted his power is attempting to overthrow the kingdom of God. First, he wages war against God's angels, but because he's defeated, he wages his attack on who? The people of the kingdom of God, referred to as brothers or saints, those who have their names written in the Lamb's book of life. Friends, I trust that's you and that's me. And the dragon and the sea beast, they conspire together, what? To strip God of his glory, of his honor and his praise, and to redirect the worship that we bring, that the people of the world would otherwise bring, to redirect the worship away from God and to himself. And although their authority is temporary and it is limited, they will succeed in gaining the worship of people from every tribe, language, and nation, but not in gaining the worship of those whom the, lamb, the slain Lamb of God has died for. And though no earthly power can fight against the beast with the power that it has from the dragon, the dragon is a conquered being. Conquered by what? By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. That is the testimony of the saints, the brothers. And we who belong to Jesus Christ may have to endure for a time what may seem like a defeat. But friends, it's only for a time. Let us take heart that our enemy is a defeated enemy. He is defeated by Christ. So you and I, we can frustrate the devil, whatever and whoever he has set up with his authority, by not bowing our knees to anyone or anything other than the Lord our God. And just like Job, though God's protection may, may be removed temporarily, we can say with Job, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. And just like Job, even if evil is allowed to touch our nearest and our dearest, maybe through disease, maybe through physical affliction, instead of cursing God, together with Job, we can say, shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? Because we can shield ourselves from the evil darts of the enemy by our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our faith that his finished work of atonement through his death has paid for all of our sins. That Jesus Christ is the resurrected one and he has made us alive again, though once we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And we can also go on the offensive with our knowledge of God's word to identify easily the lies that come from the enemy, that deceive others. And instead we have the truth that we can speak. We can annoy the enemy. Do you realize that? Simply by standing firm in Christ, even to the bitter end, and not surrendering to our fleshly desires. Wouldn't you want to frustrate the enemy? Make him really irritated at us by keeping our faith through trials, by us staying confident that the Lord keeps all his promises, by us simply waiting upon the Lord for his good timing instead of us taking those shortcuts that the enemy thinks we'll be willing to take. By praising God, even when God allows the devil a small battle of victory over us. Simply by enduring every trial and affliction, by continuing to share the gospel with others, we can prove that we are among those who are named in the Lamb's book of life. By us gathering here on a Sunday and worshiping God, speaking his truth, the songs that we sang today, that there is no one like our God, praising him in his sanctuary, singing songs that honor him with our tongues and our voices, making melody in our hearts to express our gratitude by us simply breaking out with songs of joy in the midst of our hardship, by singing whether we're in the congregation or when we're at home, even if we don't feel like it, that from our lips still comes the praise of our Savior Jesus Christ. That's what the enemy wants to, uh, to, uh, to defeat us to prevent us from doing, from, prevent us from testifying of God's grace and mercy. If we just say, how good is the Lord and how great are his works, that will irritate him. That's what he wants to, to have cease. And we can let the devil know that he will never have our knees bow down to him, and we will never direct our worship to anyone but our Savior and our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Are you with me? Amen. So whoever or whatever this beast of the sea represents, God's people will endure through the trials by keeping the faith. What else are we called to, friends? Well, God's people also will be wise enough to avoid being deceived. Notice this second beast, verse 11 here, chapter 13. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls, here it is, friends, this calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Notice first comes a description. This beast has two horns like a lamb and speaks like a dragon. Notice the authority and activity of this beast. It exercises authority just like the first beast, but makes the earth's inhabitants worship the first beast, not itself. And it performs great signs, miracles like fire coming down from heaven. It deceives the earth's inhabitants, telling them to make an image of the first beast to be worshiped. And it even gives breath to that image so that the image can speak, requiring all to worship the image that those who would not worship it would be slain and requiring all to wear the mark of that first beast on their right hand or their forehead. And without that mark, no one can buy or sell. And so John issues this call to wisdom. Friends, we are called to be wise. And if you are a careful observer of this text, hopefully you notice 
how many similarities there are between this anti-trinity and the true Godhead. The true Godhead is the trinity of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And what does Jesus reveal about, the, about God the Father and God the Son? He says that he was sent into the world to show us the Father. And in his ministry on earth, Jesus said that the Son, quote, can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. All of his authority comes from the Father. And he acknowledges that the words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. So the Father has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. You notice some of the similarities there? And before Jesus was crucified, when he knew that his hour had come, he would return to the Father. What did he promise his followers? Another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. And what is the ministry of the Spirit of truth? That helper, Jesus says, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is not to speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. He will glorify me, says Jesus, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And notice how the enemy of God is embodied in this anti-trinity of the dragon, the sea beast, and this land beast later on referred to as the false prophet. Satan is seen in the form of a dragon, and he's the one at war with God and his angels. But remember how Satan is cast down. And he's cast down making war against the offspring of the woman who are described as those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. This dragon gives his authority to the beast that rises out of the sea. And this beast that rises out of the sea suffers a mortal wound, but that wound has been healed, inspiring the people to worship it. And the dragon and the beast of the sea are worshipped, but the beast that rises from the land uses its supernatural powers to cause people to worship the beast of the sea. So many similarities of the trinity of the true Godhead. And the land beast does not demand worship from people, but instead commands people to worship the image of the sea beast, right? And the number of this land beast is 666, the number of a man. Now, we won't get into what they, all the possibilities are, okay? There are widely divergent views of this number 666. And, if, and I don't want to spend time speculating on the endless possibilities of reference to a historical person some have said it's the Emperor Nero or Hitler or any other evil person yet to enter the world stage. But this practice called gematria, where you take letters and assign values to each letter, is very common. And it can easily lead us astray to identifying someone, the wrong person, as this false prophet. Funny how one of the commentators, speaking of how it has led some to identify Nero Caesar as the second beast, requires, and I quote, to calculate a Hebrew transliteration of the Greek form of a Latin name and that with a defective spelling. So you can find your way to 666 with pretty much any person's name. And if the numbers aren't intended to be representative of an actual name, then perhaps they are to be understood symbolically. And in fact, that is the most common symbolism that what these numbers mean is that six falls short of the perfect number seven, often considered the number of completion or perfection. See, in the Bible, there are numbers that keep recurring. Twelve tribes of Israel, twelve apostles, right? We see the number 40. There are 40 days that Moses spent on Mount Sinai, 40 years spent in the wilderness. And very common in the Bible, especially in Revelation, is the number seven. Seven days of creation, seven churches in Revelation, seven spirits of God, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. You, you, are you beginning to see the picture? And six is close to seven, but still incomplete or imperfect. Six, six, six could represent, as one commentator writes, failure upon failure upon failure. I quote from the New International Commentary on the New Testament, quote, it is symbolic of the beast's continuing failure to accomplish his purpose it is the trinity of imperfection. So, if the objective of this unholy anti-trinity is to inspire and coerce worship away from the true Godhead, and if the identifying mark of the worshipers of this anti-trinity could parallel or parody the seal upon the foreheads of the servants of the true God, and if this vision of this second beast, the land beast, calls for wisdom, I believe there's an important application for us, and it is this. 
that the true worshipers of God, the worshipers whom the Father seeks, we must be wise and discerning enough that we do not ever believe the enemy's lies and submit ourselves in worship to the devil. Certainly not to overtly worship him, but also not to worship him inadvertently. So the beast could be whoever or whatever it is that exercises the authority of Satan. His message will be one of blasphemy against God. He will revile against God's name. He will slander his character, denigrate his word, cast down truth, oppose his church. And his efforts are focused on redirecting the worship that only God is worthy of. And his primary method of achieving his goal is in deception. So the important application for us is we have to be wise enough to discern truth from error. Because as a master of deception, the devil is a very skilled imitator. Six is close to seven, but not quite the perfection of seven. So the best way to deceive someone who would pay a high price for a luxury good is to do what? To make an imitation that looks so much like the real thing, right? That even the trained eye can't tell the difference. Banknotes, well-known pieces of art, are prime examples of forgeries that can sometimes be so good that you can convince the machine readers or even art experts. So whether this beast of Revelation 13 is symbolic of a past authority or perhaps a future authority, we can safely interpret them as symbolic of the pervasive attempts of Satan to redirect the worship of God to himself. So, for us, in periods or times in our country or in our countries where persecution of Christians exist, perhaps the call to endurance and faith may be more relevant, right? That we must continue to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. We must love not our lives even unto death. We have to put on the full armor of God to wrestle against the spiritual forces of evil. We have to stand firm in our faith, wield that sword of the Spirit of God, which is the word, until that enemy is finally defeated. For those of us living in persecution or in countries where we are being persecuted, that may be the more direct application. But many of us today are not fighting day to day against an authority who is trying to eliminate our faith, are we? So for us as followers of Christ, perhaps here this call to wisdom may be a little more relevant, at least today. Because here, right, we have the freedom of religion guaranteed to us by the Constitution. We live at a time today where we can freely gather. We can proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. We can worship God loudly. We can have our amplifiers turned on, right? We're not being persecuted or suppressed at any time right now of worshiping God. So our beast, as one commentary so aptly describes, is, quote, a subtle adversary who can work through culture, government, and false religion, all the while seeking to erode biblical faith and the eternal kingdom it represents. From Clinton Arnold, one of my professors, actually. Cultures everywhere in the world all contain a set of values, ethics, and common beliefs. Some of them may be influenced by biblical laws and principles, but especially with the passage of time, most cultural values will digress into that which is popular, that which is more commonly accepted, that which reflects the behavior of this, our generation. And guess who is pleased by the regression? And guess who's displeased by the regression? Now, I'm not going to attempt to name the literature, the media, the movies, the games, entertainment, the fashion trends, philosophies, music. I'm not going to start naming those things which possibly are the enemy's work in undermining God's truth. You and I, We'll probably have much disagreement about that, but you and I both must always be aware that God's enemy is very subtle, and the call to us is the call for wisdom. Cultures, but also governments. In many countries, they legislate certain conducts of behavior as either acceptable or they are criminal, and such legislation, especially in a democratic country like ours, will be influenced by the people whom the legislators are to represent. We see how in some countries it becomes a criminal offense to refer to some sexual acts as sinful. But God has indeed told us what is an abomination. And guess who's behind the effort to discredit the word of God and establish a set of values and norms that become laws contrary to God's laws? Well, you can see from Revelation who that is. And God's enemy is allowed, in fact, to exercise authority. And we know he will use that authority 
to influence those in government. And then there's false religions, all of them contradicting the revelation of God preserved in the word of God, intended to undermine the eternal truth of God. They may come across as a philosophy, maybe they'll call themselves an ideology, a worldview, a doctrinal system, a faith movement, a world religion. And there may be similarities, there may be some common use of words and terms, there may be even holy scriptures, perhaps prophecies. But we have to discern the truth from the error, and that requires wisdom. So whoever or whatever this beast represents will continually be assailing Christians through persecution or through the subtle deception, as the commentary would continue, but both threats call for a mind of wisdom which only the Holy Spirit can give. So our ability to discern is in fact critical. The visions in chapter 14 and 15 of Revelation make it clear that those who do worship the beast and its image and who bear its mark will receive God's wrath. Those who conquer the beast and its image, they are God's people who will forever worship the Lord God Almighty. So in conclusion, a quick review. So the visions here of the dragon, the beast from the sea, and the beast from the land help make the people of God aware that there is a spiritual battle at hand. And it may be tempting for us, right, to predict or to identify who is represented by each of the elements of these symbolism, right? We all love these kinds of conversations, but we are to be steadfast in our faith, enduring through trials to overcome the plans of the enemy of God. And we are to be wise enough to see through the deception of the enemy who's very clever at imitating God. So, knowing what you and I know, would you truly go into battle ill-equipped? Would you go to battle without his armor? Someone might say, well, David went to battle without the armor, right? In the battle against Goliath, he had only a slingshot for a weapon, but yes, but he went in the name of the Lord of hosts. And today, the Lord's presence is with the Christian saint in the form of his finished work through Christ. The armor that was described that Chip read last week is a metaphor for what Christ has already done. It enables us to do what? To stand against the schemes of the devil. And as Chip last week encouraged us, let us remember that Christ's finished work on the cross means that we can stand firm against the devil because we're clothed in Christ's righteousness. We hold the truth of God close at hand to discern the lies. We're ready to go to battle because we have the gospel of peace, the message that the enemy wants to reach. Our faith in Jesus and the finished work of his cross extinguishes the lies that the devil uses as he tries to accuse us of guilt. Our salvation is by God's grace through faith, and it is not because of our own righteousness, and we have God's word that is like a sword for us to go on the offensive against God's enemy. What does he want? He wants to conquer God's people. But God's true worshipers will endure, and we will exercise wisdom against him. Let us pray. Our God in heaven, as we bow before you, we confess Jesus Christ is Lord of all. The Son of God, who came to us to, on earth, to show us the Father who died on the cross to pay for our sins, that we might be clothed with his righteousness, that you, O Lord, made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we in him might become the righteousness of Christ. And so, Lord, we who are your saints, we pray for your strength and power, especially when the enemy tries to assail. Oh Lord, we pray that we would not attempt this battle in our own strength. Forgive us, Father, when we fall and when we uh, choose to believe the lies that he spews out of his mouth of haughty and blasphemous words. We thank you, Lord, that when every time we come in here and we proclaim the name of Jesus Christ, that we're doing the very thing that he's trying to hinder us from doing. And I pray, Lord, that each one of us here would make it that point, not just on Sundays to be at church and to worship gladly and rejoice in your name, but also every day of the week, Lord, 
May your praise be on our lips. May our gratitude be expressed, not just be thought, but actually verbalized so that the enemy can hear that even though we might feel like we've lost the battle, we still rejoice in the Lord our God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.